Welcome back aliens, my name is Avin Reddy and in this video we'll talk about cloud native and 12 factor app. Now basically when we talk about applications, I'm talking about the enterprise level application. Now initially those applications used to stay in on-premise, basically every company will have their own servers and they will deploy the application on their own servers. But then we have talked about cloud, right? Now most of the companies are moving from on-premise to cloud. So basically all the services which we are using nowadays is cloud-based. Even the public application like Google Docs, Dropbox, Gmail, everything is cloud. Now the applications which are used internally in the company, they are also being deployed on the cloud. Of course, not every company is moving into it, but majorly, most of the applications are on cloud nowadays. Now, the moment you talk about cloud applications, we have two interesting terms here. The first one is cloud ready, and the second one is cloud native. And then it's important to understand the difference between these two. See, what we expect from a cloud application is the cloud services. The moment you talk about cloud, it provides a lot of different benefits, right? Benefits in terms of cost, benefit in terms of scaling, and benefit in terms of less issues, right? Now, if you want to achieve that, of course, you have to make an application which will use all those services and which will fulfill the promises, right? But what happens is the application which are deployed on the cloud are of two types. One is cloud ready, second is cloud native. Now, what do you mean by cloud ready? So let's say you already have an application in your premises, okay, so in your, in your own local server. Now you want to move that particular application on the cloud. You have to make some changes. It's not like you picked up the application and throw it on the cloud. No, that's not how it works. Basically, you have to make some changes to your existing application and you have to make it cloud ready. Maybe work with the environment variables, maybe work with the configuration files and make sure that you are able to push your application on the cloud and you should be able to use the services. So you are basically making your non-cloud ready application cloud ready, as simple as that. But on the other hand, if you really want to use all the cloud services and if you want to make it more effective, you have to build an application as cloud native. Now normally this type of applications are new application. Let's say you got a new project and then you have to decide now. Do you want to build on premise or do you want to use it on the cloud? And the moment you say, okay, that's what we are, we are going for. We want to build an application which is for cloud. Make sure it is cloud native so that it can use all the features. But how exactly you make a cloud native application? In fact, the name itself says, right, native. So it is meant for cloud, right? Now, if you want to achieve this, we can follow certain standards and rules. Now, of course, in this world, we have a lot of developers, a lot of companies who want to build the application for cloud. So they thought, okay, can we just create some standards? In fact, Heroku created these standards for you and you can follow them to build a better application for cloud, basically a cloud native application. Of course, right, how do you define a cloud native application? So just follow the rules and you're done. The thing is, these rules actually made long back and now we have few changes, but let's talk about those rules which have been developed at that point. And that is called a 12 factor app. So basically you have to follow this 12 rules or standards, which is 12 factor app, which they called. In fact, there's a website as well, and you can find the link in description, which talks about all 12 rules in detail, but I will try to simplify it so that you will understand in one go. Now, basically these are the 12 factors you have to follow to build a cloud native application. Starting from the first one, which is called a code base. Now, basically what happens is we normally store all the coding files in your folder, right? So basically when you make a project, you store that in your project, maybe in IDE or any editor which you use. Now, what code base says is if you want to build a cloud native application, you have to make sure that your code base is, is using a version control. So example, it, it says one code, one code base tracked in a revision control and many deploys. So basically we can use something like a Git here. So inside Git, you have to make sure that you store your project there in a local, or maybe you can use some uh, remote repositories, let's say GitHub, GitLab, and we have multiple options there. So you should have only one code base. I know you want to use on a different environments, maybe development environment, uh, staging environment, or maybe production environment. So even if you have multiple environments there, make sure that you have only one code base and that too in one repository. And then you can have a multiple deployments in staging, in development, in, in production, that's your choice, or maybe for testing. The thing is you should have only one code base for one application. 
Yeah, if you have one code base for multiple application, so that's where you're breaking the rules. So then make sure that you have one code base for one application. So not multiple code base for one application and not even multiple apps in one code base. So one code base for one application. Second we have is dependencies. Of course, when you build a project, there are multiple dependencies which you work with. Example, in Java, we have to work with, let's say I want to use some database connection. So if you have to use a, a dependency for database, maybe you want to do it for logging, you need one, dependency for logging as well. Now tendencies, when you build a project, in fact, we used to do that in the earlier days, when you build a project, there's a, there's a folder which, call, which, which says libraries. And this is where you put all your packages and jar files. You say, okay, for this particular project, I got all these dependencies. And then now, when you want to basically give this project to someone else, maybe you have an ops team who will deploy the application. Now you will give all the jar files as well to them. That's not a good idea. There can be also a problem where you say, okay, this project needs these dependencies and there might be some version issues. Maybe you are using 2.5 for a particular dependency and the ops team are using 2.6 or 2.4. There might be some issues, right? So make sure that you have a separate file, like a manifest file. Uh, example, in Java, we use uh, Maven. So basically in this Maven, you, you, you mention all the dependencies which you need with versions and then keep it separate. Don't link it to your code base. Now, when you share this code with someone else, you also share this dependencies, uh, the manifest file, not the actual dependencies, and they can download it with the version and the actual name. So that's how you separate it. Next we have is configuration. See, we have to accept it. We always love hard coding, right? Like, I'm kidding. So basically what you do is, in your, in your code basically, if you want to connect with a, with a database, you use a URL, you use a username and password. Uh, if you want to use a particular port number, you mention that in the code itself. So don't mention any of this stuff, any of the configuration inside your code. That's what it says. So store configuration in the environment. So basically what you should do is create a different file, maybe an environment file or env file and save all the values there. The advantage would be even if you change your physical servers or anything related to the environment, you don't have to change your source code. Just change the environment variable and you're done. So the idea is don't touch your code once it is built. Next we have is backing services. So it basically relates to the above parts as well. So what it says is have a loose coupling between your application and the backing services. Now these backing services can be a database, it can be some other third party services which you are using. Example, let's say if you are building an application and in this application you need some data from the third party. So try to create a separate stuff. Treat that service as a resource. Maybe in future it might change. Let's say if currently if you are using MySQL, in future you want to use Postgres. That switching should be easy. Right? So in your code, don't hard code the configuration, uh, don't specify which particular resource you want to use. Just say, okay, I want this resource and then you can just configure it outside. Okay, for this particular request, I have this resource and you can use them. So treat them as a resource, not a part of your application. Next we have is build, release and run. One of the tendencies we have is write the application, run it, Maybe you can do that on the production as well. So now we are doing it in the developer environment. On the production as well, you will say, okay, I have a code here, let me run it. Don't do that. What you will do is you have to follow a three different process, build, release, and run. So what you do is, if you have a project ready, create a package, build it. Maybe in Java, you can do it with the Maven. And once you got your package, maybe a jar file, you can give a release to it. Maybe a configuration, environment variables, and all those stuff. Now this release will go to the running environment, maybe whatever environment you're using there, whatever servers you have, whatever environment JVM you have there. And then the thing is, when you release it, you have a particular version to it, right? And that is working. The advantage would be, even if you want to make a small change, you will not do any changes in the release version. What you're doing is you're changing in the build. Again, you change it, create a new package with a different version. Every time you release it, you have a different version to it. And if something goes wrong, you can go back to the previous version. Because let's say now you have released 5.5 and then something went wrong with that, you can go back to 5.4. Or let's say in the 5.5, everything is working, you got a new feature, you just use it, uh, build a new one, 5.6 and release it. So versioning is very important there as well. So create a separate thing, build is separate, release is separate, run is separate. Next we have is processes. Now basically, whenever we talk about web applications, in the earlier days we used to go for sessions or uh, stateful services. So what is stateful basically means is, as a client if you connect to a particular server for the first request and then you share some data, next time when you connect to the server, server knows you, server knows who you are, they have the information about you. 
is a good thing? Of course, right? Next time when you go there, you don't have to uh, tell everything. You can simply say, I was there, uh, I came there yesterday and now I'm here with a new request. The thing is, by doing this, you are limiting your resources. Basically, you're saying, okay, you got this stateful service and what if something goes wrong with the stateful service? A client will say, okay, I was there yesterday. The data is lost now. So the idea is instead of going for stateful, go for stateless, where every process is just a process. It's not storing any data in the process. So every time you get a new request, you say, okay, I got your, I got your request. Let me process it. And if, if there's any data involved, the data should be coming from the attached resource. It can be a database or some other server but make sure that you're not storing anything in your particular session. Uh, so we call, we call them as sticky sessions. Uh, so don't do that. So every process will be stateless where you don't have any data. The advantage would be at any given point, you can remove the process and it should not be any matter because the moment you remove the process, data is not lost because data is stored in a permanent storage, a database. Or maybe if you want to scale up, maybe you want to get multiple process and a client will not even know which process it is going through. Maybe first time it went for process one, next time it's going for process two, which are the same application, but then we have multiple instances of it. Next we have is port binding. So basically every service will be having a unique port number for different type of service. Let's say if you, if you're using HTTP, we use AT. If you use a different protocol, we use different port number there. In the same way, whatever service you're building, attach a port number to it. Maybe because we are not sure on which physical server they are, but we are sure what type of service they are providing. So every service will have a port number. So that's why it says export services via a port binding. And that's why when you build multiple services, let's say in microservices, every service will have a different port number, right? That's how you search for it. Next we have is concurrency. The thing is different programming language have a different way of doing multi-threading and multi-processing. Now, basically in Java, that's the advantage. We have a multi-threading concept. But the thing is, even if you're using multi-threading, it can go, it can scale to a limit because see, if you're using a particular machine and you're saying, okay, I want to use multiple threads and I want to use the complete part of this machine. But of course, machine has a limit there, right? Of course, you can do a vertical scaling. Now, you, let's say if you're using i7 machine and with a 64 GB RAM, and now you're thinking, okay, we have to increase the speed of it and the capacity. You can simply go for i9 processor and you can increase the hard drive to 128 or you can increase your RAM to 128 GB. But still, there is a limit how far you can go with it. That is vertical scaling. So what concurrency model says is instead of going for vertical scaling, you can go for horizontal scaling, which is the scale out. So basically instead of using one machine or one instance, you can go for multiple instances. That's how you should build an application. You should be able to create multiple instances of the same service. Next we have is disposability. The thing is every time, in fact, we, whenever you learn a programming language, you learn this, right? Every time you open the resource, make sure you close it. Every time you start the service, make sure you're connecting to the different services, which is dependent on. Example, let's say your application is dependent on a database. So the moment you start your application, it should be able to connect to the database. But what about if you want to dispose a service? It should be easy. The moment you say, okay, I have multiple instances now for the same service. And now I want to dispose one service here. It should be possible. And also you should not lose any data. It can be system failure. It can be any problem, but you should not lose data. And that's why if you feel something goes wrong with the system, if you want to shut down properly, also save all the data in the database so that you can close it properly. Basically you have to close the connection properly. And also, even if there's a crash in your system, if there's some exceptions, close your resources properly. So that's what you say, it just says fast startup and graceful shutdown. Next we have is dev prod parity. Now this is where the new culture came up, which is DevOps, right? Now this article came way back, but the culture came after that, which is keep the development, staging, production as similar as possible. See in the earlier days, we, what we used to do is we used to build an application on your development machine. And then there are multiple ways of deploying it on a cloud or a, or a server. So you bundle the entire application, you give to the ops team. Now let's say they are on holiday or they're busy with some other project. They will deploy your project on the server, maybe after a week. And then in the development environment, you have made a lot of different changes. So there's a huge gap between what you're building now and what is being deployed on the server. And it can also impact the environment as well. So let's say on your development machine, you're using Windows and with a different IDE, different runtime. Uh, maybe a lightweight process, example for SQL, I can give you an example. Uh, on your local machine, you're using SQL Lite. On the server, you're using MySQL or Postgres. 
because you don't want to install Postgres on your machine. So in that case, if you are building in a different environment and you're giving it to, to a different environment, there might be some issues. Of course, the ops team will say, okay, we have to make all these changes, they have to communicate, and there will be a delay between the communication. But what if the dev team and ops team come together and they start working together? So as a development team itself, what if you are developing it and you are pushing the code on the server and not weekly or monthly? What if you can do that hourly? So let's say you made some changes, it's, everything is working properly, you push that to a staging environment and you're testing there and everything goes well, you can push it to the production environment. So the, the gap will be less now. And also with the help of some containers, let's say Docker. So let's say you're using a Windows machine there and you're using a Docker, you're building an image. Now that image will go to the server, even if that server is using Linux, doesn't matter because you got an image which will run on a Docker irrespective of which underlying OS you're using. So that's what this says. In fact, we also have a concept of CI-CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment or delivery. So even that is emerging from here. Next we have is logs. These are actually very important. For a developer, you know, every time you are building an application, if you want to see what is happening, you use system.out.println or you print something on your console, right? And that's how you know what is happening, right? So in the if condition, you put hi, I'm here, have you tried this? Let me know in the comment section, but I tried multiple times. But then better solution would be create a log file, right? Or maybe you can log on the console as well. But then it works on a, on a developer machine, right? You can see a console directly and you can map it. But if you really want it to work on a cloud, you basically need a proper logging service. And also you might be having a multiple process, not just one. So basically every process will generate a log. So what you have to do is, first of all, generate log from each service. That's how you can monitor the application. And what if something goes wrong, you can check there. And then you can aggregate all the logs and save it in one place so that you, when you scroll, you can see all the logs, what is happening. And the, the beauty is logs are infinite. Every time your server is running and you want your server to run, you can see logs continuously piling up. So you have to use a better service to log everything properly so that you can watch it, you can see what is happening. And the last one we have is an admin process. Now basically, you should be able to admin your application from the outside as well. So maybe exposing some port or using some services. So it should, there should be also an admin service there. So yeah, that's how you follow a 12-factor app and you can build a cloud native application. Initially, it will be difficult, but then uh, think in a cloud-first strategy, right? That's what you say. Uh, don't build an application for a development machine and then you can say, okay, now you have to move to the cloud. If you really want to use all the cloud services, get a cloud first approach and build a cloud native application with the help of 12 factor app. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comment section and do subscribe for further videos. Bye-bye.